On accueille M. Woodbridge qui représente la société Bedrocan. Thank you for coming in France to present your products. <laughs> We listen to you, and then uh, we'll ask you some questions. Uh, uh, no. no, you have to sit. Bonjour. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Martin Woodbridge, uh, a principal advisor for strategy operations in the Asia Pacific region. I'm based in Wellington, New Zealand, so it's a unique opportunity for me to be in uh, Den Haag and then travel to here to Paris today. I'd like to uh, 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 make it clear I am not here to represent the uh, Ministry of Health or the Dutch government, nor what, what I discuss is the opinion or thoughts of the Ministry of Health or the Dutch government. <coughs> I'd like to, to focus uh, the attention around these discussions. Sorry. Sorry. I'd like to focus the attention around these discussions, uh, in particular on the safe introduction of cannabis-based medicines. In the lead up to developing the uh, uh, slides for this presentation. I discussed uh, with uh, uh, your colleagues about what is of interest. So today I will provide more global insights from my experience as a, as a government regulator in medicines analysis, as well as from my work with Betracan, having interacted with various uh, governments, regulators, clinical networks and industry across these different jurisdictions. And you will note that uh, each of these jurisdictions have variable times in which they have uh, had cannabinoid therapeutic products available to the market. So I'll use my global insights there to, to answer the questions that have been posed, and that includes around dose form, around the conditions and dose regimen uh, as, as a discussion uh, on posology dosing in particular, and treatment costs. I'd like to be able to explain a little bit after that about some of the lessons learned as well, in summary. So dose forms. The choice of dose forms should be led by science. So what does clinical research collectively inform us uh, and, and to show which is uh, the, the most viable dose forms that are going to be the safest uh, for administration. But also led by in clinical use. And we know that that's, we are still in a situation where not all clinical data sits with these products. Uh, and as a result, informing us uh, about the importance of form. So the dose form can influence patient behaviour markedly. For example, if a patient takes their medicine, is there adherence to the regimen that's been prescribed? When people take it the time of the day, how often patients take it, so the frequency of their use and how much patients have to take their total daily dose. It also has influence on side effects and how these are tolerated. And we collectively uh, across the globe, the, the collective cl in clinical use and clinical research surrounding cannabis products uh, is, is informing us more to the points where we can make uh, a good assessment as to th at least three dose forms. So the immediate onset of action uh, with inhalation by vaporization means that it is often a preferred choice for, for many patients, but it's not a typical dose form. There are still complications with uh, administering via vaporization, uh, standardizing that process. And as a result, there's hurdles to access and use, and I believe this is a global situation. Oral sublingual dosing, uh, again, it's similar to medicines patients are already taking, 
uh, and it's easy to administer, but it's also a familiar dose form for most prescribers and pharmacists. Concentrated oily uh, extracts are becoming increasingly popular with up to 50% of the market in the Netherlands and around 90% in Australia using oral dose forms. While in clinical use and clinical data uh, is not substantive around transdermals, particularly creams, uh, patches, there still is uh, uh, current uh, clinical use and applications to treat skin conditions uh, for localised muscular or joint pain uh, are, are warranted. So in summary, I, I think we're sitting in a, a, with a situation where we have robust clinical data which suggests that the three dose forms, inhalation, oral sublingual and transdermal creams may be warranted as the favoured dose forms at this point in time. Conditions and dose regimen. One option uh, that sits around pathology, so finding the appropriate doses, uh, certainly could be that we take this as a case-by-case -case basis. In some countries uh, that I've worked in or with, uh, this is an option where multiple indications are at the prescriber's discretion. So prescribers are able to prescribe at their will based on what they believe is, is a robust therapeutic indication. There's opportunities with a case-by-case -case approach. There is opportunities to find new treatments for difficult cases. And, and around therapeutic option is, is clearly an important um, uh, component there. A case-by-case -case approach, however, does require a research approach to prescribing. What do I mean by that? Well, because we don't have sufficient clinical data surrounding some indications, a prescriber and their pharmacist must treat this more as a research process. And as such, it requires the generation of new insights on those specific indications and the understanding how to assess uh, efficacy and safety, so what clinical tools should be used. A case by case basis is a difficult approach and really it appears that the, the more favoured approach is specific indications. So multi-indications derived from clinical knowledge. Uh, the knowledge of dosing for specific indications is, is available. Uh, insights from in-clinical use as well as clinical research um, sh indicates w what medicine interactions may occur and tolerance, particularly when we're dealing with complex disease states. If we're looking at palliative care, for example, we may find that patients are on multiple medicines and the risk of medicine-medicine interaction uh, is, is an important consideration. When we look at specific indications and prescribing on specific indications, this reduces some of the risk associated with that. At this point, uh, when we look at specific indications, dose form reflects the indication. So if we're looking at particular uh, development of dose forms, it may be that patients are being treated for appetite stimulation but are less able to swallow, for example, so an inhalatory product as a dose form may be more appropriate. Clinical tools for safety and efficacy are well defined when we approach this on a specific indication um, uh, as well as it reduces the risk of adverse drug reactions because there's greater knowledge around those specific, specific indications. Possibly also, and I think this is an important component when we are looking at the introduction of these medicines into France, then it's, it's important to ensure that these particular patient populations are well managed to reduce the possibility of diversion and misuse. So well managed patient populations are, are key. That falls into the line which I which I can see uh, will be the case here in France where we will have a prescriber pharmacy model. That means that a patient will receive a prescription for a valid indication and then is dispensed by a pharmacy. So patients in that model are offered more objective communications of the risks and benefits and the safety of health professional guidance. So let's reflect on the Dutch experience for a short time. 
why have I looked specifically at, at, the, at the Netherlands? Because it has had a program in place for a long period of time. It was one of the first alongside Canada. However, the expectations of standardisation and pharmaceutical quality have been implemented in the Dutch uh, program since the start and continues to be that case. Moreover, because it's a monopoly situation in the Netherlands that all products are derived from one single source, we're able to gather prescribing data from the National Prescribing Service to evaluate actually what is happening in the Netherlands. So if we look at prescribing, it is increasing year on year. There's been an increase from 6.4 to 25 per 100,000 people between 2003, the implementation of the program, and to 2016. Again, to 2019, unpublished data suggests that it is increasing more and more. 70% are aged 40 years and over and of those, 43 are 41 to 60 years, and 31% are 61 to 80 years of age. So we're dealing with an older population generally that are receiving these products. And again, when we're looking at older populations, the risk is that these patients are on multiple medications, particularly given the circumstance or the indications under which cannabinoids would be prescribed and 51% are female. I think this is a very interesting point in particular because there's always been a perception that the use of cannabis and cannabis-based products is very much the domain of males and particularly young males. There's a desire amongst that, but you can see in the Dutch population that there really is a, an even split and very much an older population who are consuming these products therapeutically. So if we look at uh, who is actually prescribing, majority is occurring in general practice or family medicine, and again in pain medicine, internal medicine, neurology and psychiatry. So what does all this mean? Why? Why, is, why are we seeing prescribing year on year increase? I think part of it is, is particularly around price. It aims to be affordable even without insurance, and again this is a very critical factor here. If a medicine is going to be uh, included in a patient's drug regimen, it's essential that that patient can afford to continue that medicine use if it's not being subsidised or it's not being covered by their insurance. Quality, uh, fully standardised and high quality medicines are available and I think that is the underlying issue that sits with prescribing. Prescribers want to prescribe good quality medicines, they don't want to have access to substandard medicines. Stigma, there is a changing patient and prescribing perceptions around these products as legitimate medicines. And therapeutic option, there's inhalation and oral dose forms and that has, has meant greater access to a greater number of patients. So that was considering uh, uh, looking at indications and dosing um, and the importance uh, of a prescriber pharmacy model. What about dosing in particular? Well, good clinical research supports use in chronic pain, particularly associated with the nervous pain, uh, uh, neuro neurological pain, uh, nausea, loss of appetite, weight loss and vomiting, particularly around chemotherapy induced uh, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, um, its use in, in cancer uh, treatment around anorexia and also cachexia. Pain and muscle spasms, as, as is well documented, but also uh, in hard to treat epilepsy, there's less data associated with this, but epilepsy, epilepsy is typically well controlled by existing medications. However, there are some patients that benefit from these medicines, in particular Tourette's syndrome, which is where the clinical focus is at the moment. I sat uh, with my colleague, a, a pain physician uh, from LUMC, uh, just last night actually talking about dosing protocols and uh, the importance of um, how to deliver a full and robust protocol for prescribing, especially given that these are novel medicines uh, at this point in time. And a treatment protocol really should be considered uh, as part of the guidelines for prescribing these medicines, in particular um, giving patients uh, advice on an appropriate starting dose 
how to increase doses, so the minimum and maximum doses, how to find an optimal daily dose based on the severity of the patient's conditions uh, and changes in their medication, how to maintain their daily dose, medicine and food interactions, ways to reduce the risk of side effects and adverse drug reactions occurring, and a plan to stop treatment if there is poor response. And this is a critical issue, I think, that's sometimes uh, not considered as actually the cessation of treatment if it is not considered to be beneficial to the patient. And this is where I, I come back to the idea about indication-specific prescribing and the importance of actually having robust clinical tools to ensure that you can measure the efficacy and safety of that drug regimen. So dosing protocols are critical in my mind. This is a, uh, a difficult question that was asked, and, I, and I, we did discuss this by phone prior to, to me presenting. Uh, treatment, cost of treatment is, is a multifaceted uh, question, you might say, or multifaceted consideration, and it certainly hinges on indications. So are we talking about appetite stimulation, which may be a patient consuming three small doses a day before meals? Or are we talking about neuropathic pain where there's a, 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 a more um, intense uh, and, and ongoing uh, intake of medicines? So indications are really important. One, what specifically are we talking about? Second is really the medicine. So what is the content of that medicine? What is the dose form? Are patients required to uh, buy or purchase a vaporizer to administer that product that will have a, a cost associated with it. Quality again is a, is a critical issue which also is underlined by clinical data supporting that product which all adds both value to the product but also cost in, into the product. Dosing, so what is the dose regimen and again that links back into the indications but also the duration of their treatment. And I mentioned earlier on the importance of actually having products or, or, or uh, that are affordable for patients in the long term, particularly if they're not being subsidised or, or being uh, um, uh, paid for with um, individual insurances. The industry plays a critical role here as well. So pharmacoeconomic issues uh, and things around economies of scale and competition in the market will will pay a, f a, a factor in, in the cost of treatment, likewise dispensing. So what are the pharmacy costs? Are there going to be co-payments and subsidies associated with these products? Uh, what are the regulations that sit around that and the bureaucratic policy that uh, associated with this, particularly for pharmacy and prescribing, because that will all have costs associated. So while there will be questions directed to me today, I would ask that we consider uh, specific questions around the cost of treatment that I can come back with more detailed answers at a later date. So what are the sum of the lessons learned given my background and also my interaction with uh, regulatory agencies, clinical professionals and industry across those numerous jurisdictions internationally? There's a history already. There's certainly a history in the Netherlands and Canada. There are other parts of the world. New Zealand has had a, a program since 2007, at which time I wrote the guidelines while I was at the Ministry of Health. So there is a history of, of use. Uh, and what lessons can we learn from other countries? And certainly what lessons can France learn from other countries? And I would recommend that it is around good government regulations. They must be workable and they must foster industry development. Industry self-regulation and quality assurance uh, should be a priority alongside GMP requirements. And clinical use and education is often, uh, uh, education around clinical use is often an unfilled requirement. I've seen that in multiple jurisdictions around the world. 
uh, real full engagement with clinical networks is a, is a priority and that includes not only prescribers but also pharmacy and into nursing and primary care as their relationship ex exists with the patient. For pharmacovigilance purposes this is also necessary. Checks and balances. I'm not sure if this is a terminology that's used in France but certainly it means about Yep, okay. Uh, GMP provides that framework which ensures accountability. And the prescriber pharmacy model provides an appropriate checks and balances uh, to prevent dose escalation, abuse, diversion, and misuse. And you remember earlier on in this discussion, I talked about the importance of pre prescriber and pharmacy guidance and oversight, particularly the, what, what is a well-managed population because that is part of the issues I think a lot of countries, Thailand was in particular an, a great example, as was New Zealand and Australia, as we implemented these policies, how one of the greatest concerns was, are we introducing a new medicine into the market, which can again result in misuse and diversion and misuse? Are we going to have another opioid em epidemic? And certainly my discussions at LUMC with uh, my clinical colleague really focused around how to manage patient populations. A medicines framework is very important and, and that prescriber pharmacy model comes into there again, but GMP is key to product quality and consistency and to patient safe, safety. Uh, the the cannabis-based medicines, while they're relatively safe, they have a wide therapeutic index often. It depends on the uh, concentration and formulation. But it's not a medicine without risk of, of harm, or indeed real harms associated to them. And that prescriber pharmacy model provides the guidance required, I, th I believe, for patient safety, or at least to enhance patient safety. And finally, regional initiatives, initiatives are required. Pharmacovigilance is often a, uh, a part of our regulatory agencies that, that may be glanced over for this type of product. Good medicine intelligence requires regional data collection and data harmonisation. I've travelled through to Thailand, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, etc., talking and discussing about the importance of pharmacovigilance and the harmonisation of data. Now, why is harmonisation and regional data collection important? Because we have small patient populations. We also have multiple formulations and companies producing dose forms. It's important that at this point in time, we're able to collect data from different countries, harmonise that, anonymise that, to be able to identify trends that may be occurring with particular formulations and among particular patient populations. And I think this is critical that we're all working together regionally and globally to be able to identify these trends. Um, so certainly if, if this agency is interested, I can link you into other agencies globally who I've been discussing these points with. Uh, again, pharmacovigilance as education is something outside of Betricane's role, other than the importance or the requirements of Betricane to collect and share data around the reports of adverse drug reactions or, or faults and devices, for example. The final critical issue is education. So it's my belief that uh, we need to standardise education. It needs to be made uh, very available. It needs to be uh, often jurisdiction specific but most of the information is uh, globally relevant. Why online formats? Because this is still a niche product. Health professionals have continuing medical education requirements already. However, we need to make this available to the point that should a prescriber or pharmacist engage in this prescribing and dispensing, they have the ability to go online and cherry pick information based on their skills and abilities and enhance their knowledge. This information needs to be equivalent across regions but also uh, again as I mentioned specific to particular populations. Thailand's a good example. If we look at the palliative care situation in Thailand it's just initiating 
the curriculum has just been approved last year and has been uh, funding from the government is really going ahead. So in this point in time, you know, we're looking at very specific issues, particularly around even how they're prescribing opioids, and that's very tie specific. And the relationship that cannabinoids in this in this jurisdiction will have also uh, must be considered in the same kind of way. When I talk about education, uh, this was produced uh, um, independent of, of Bedrican. Uh, this is a product um, that has been developed under the policy of education without commercial bias. And it dis it's, a, it's a primer, so it's called the Primer to Medicinal Cannabis. It's an introductory text to the therapeutic use of cannabis. It discusses um, the ins and outs, you might say, of, of cannabis as it, as it forms as a medicine. But it also takes a step forward to uh, look at the insights from experienced clinician, experienced pharmacist, and also delves into a PhD of a colleague of mine from Belgium who looked at the patient experience. It's been peer reviewed by another colleague, a clinical pharmacologist, etc., uh, etc. Et now this is uh, in the process of being uh, translated into Thai for uptake by the Thai Ministry of Health. So I've brought a copy of this for each of you today. I appreciate it's in English. My apologies, but uh, it's a very easy read um, and and thoroughly uh, um, referenced. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer the questions that I can today, uh, but I will also note down specific questions and get back to you with more detail after conferencing with my colleagues. Thank you very much. Any question? Gilles Dedon. You, you presented in your talks uh, Dutch experience, and I was quite interesting to, to notice that uh, most of the patient, most of the patient receiving a cannabinoid a drug was patient uh, aged more than 40. That's one point. The second is that you, you pointed out uh, the importance of the GP, the general practitioner, that most of the time is the prescriber of, uh, of the medication, at least in, uh, in uh, Neverland. And so, uh, and you discussed about education. So, at the end, uh, the Dutch experience, what about the, the quality of the training in, in these countries, uh, the experience in the general practitioner that is authorized to, to prescribe? Is it a, a complete uh, authorization for prescribing in some specific uh, patient that has resistance to the medication? <coughs> Uh, and uh, how the, the line uh, change over time uh, uh, according to the real indication of the use of this drug? Mm. So you're correct that, that it is an older population that's using and consuming these medicines. We're also seeing similar trends in other jurisdictions around the world. Um, the reason why we're moving, uh, sorry, I think the older population reflects that it's being prescribed for particular conditions uh, that are related to ageing, related to cancer incidence, palliative care, etc. So that's why we're seeing that, and again why we're seeing that 50-50 in terms of gender. The GP, <coughs> the GP are prescribing. There's a range of reasons why that's occurring. Um, it's, it's hard to really fully understand from, from collecting data, from the prescribing data, but to make inferences. But it's, th there's a few reasons. Firstly, a prescriber uh, is has a set of recommended indications uh, by the Ministry of Health. However, a prescriber is able to make independent decisions about what indications they choose uh, to prescribe in, to prescribe on. They are at, uh, uh, put themselves at a certain level of risk by prescribing outside, um, but again, it's, it's up to them. General practice are often co-managing patient populations uh, with uh, specialist services. Uh, so they are also seeing a full spectrum, as you can imagine, a full spectrum of uh, uh, um, indications or disease states because of the nature of their job. 
when you actually look at prescribing, you'll see that the indications they're prescribing for are actually pretty similar to the indications that uh, 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 pain specialists, etc., cetera, are uh, prescribing as well. Okay. Does that answer your question yeah, yes, completely? Yes. Okay. Uh, you, on one slide, you, you indicate that it should be affordable, affordable for uh, those who have no insurance. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it's not uh, paid for each patient by the by uh, national health services? And on two, uh, so what is what is the cost in at least in uh, in uh, Netherlands? The, the 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 cost issue is a complex one. Um, if I can find a, a suitable time that I can write to the secretary and I can provide more substantial uh, advice around particular indications and give you a, a, um, a, a, a field from which uh, a patient might, um, the, the costs associated with each of those indications, I will do that at a later stage. Uh, but there's a few things. We're dealing with an unregistered medicine. Even though Bedrican uh, was the first company and still remains the first company to achieve GMP for the cultivated cannabis floss, the whole dried flower, and we are moving into the space also to, for full clinical research programs, we are still dealing at this point in time with an unregistered medicine. That creates complications uh, not only for the National Health Service as a subsidy body for, for, for medicines but also for, uh, um, for medicine insurers, so health insurers. So if we're looking at uh, New Zealand for example who has a subsidi subsidised um, uh, agency, a medicine subsidy agency called Pharmac, this as a medicine can only be included if it's shown to be more efficacious and cheaper than the current medicine that it's being prescribed for. Similar kinds of things are happening around the world and again you'll most, most find that these medicines are not subsidised for patients or not fully paid for for patients. As a result it's essential that at least in the Netherlands and under the, the uh, Dutch program that the, the, the Ministry of Health has focused its attention to make them affordable medicines for for as many patients as possible. That comes back, and these are all considerations every country has to make, is when we are approving these medicines for use, even if they are not registered medicines, that if it is going to be prescribed to a patient, can the patient afford that, and can they afford it for the duration of the treatment? And that's where the idea of the treatment protocol is so important these kind of considerations must be included within the discussions with the patient but also within the protocol on, on how you will treat the patient as a prescriber. Is it working? Yes, so thank you. Uh, I understood that uh, based on the Dutch experience the preferred preferral doses of patients is inhalations, but also can you tell us if there is a preferred dosage in terms of ratio between CBD and THC? Uh, yes, this is interesting. I, I can also provide you a copy of prescribing Bedrican, which describes uh, a, a, um, analysis of patients uh, based on indications. So you will find that for certain indications, people are being prescribed certain concentrations of CBD, THC. There's a, there is a, th and it's, it's best if I actually pro pro provide you that as a document for your perusal rather than discuss in depth now. The, the, sorry, can you reiterate your question again? Can you ask your question again? Yes, my question is, is there, is, uh, is there a preferred dosage in terms of uh, uh, oh, sorry. ratio of CBD and THC? Yeah based on the Dutch experience. Okay, so if we so that's uh, based on the indication will be the the preferred drug product in terms of its content will be based on the indication. But also the familiarity also of those products with specific prescriber. 
if we're looking at the dose form, that's also something to consider because half of the patient population would be prescribed uh, uh, cannabis floss, which is the whole dried flower for inhalation. But now that oral dose forms, a sublingual drop for under the tongue is available, 50% of the market has become uh, 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 dosing by oral. What's, m what's interesting about that <coughs> is that it's been a rapid development. So we've seen the introduction of that and then almost an exponential increase in prescribing. And it does reinforce in my mind, and I discussed this earlier, about the importance of dose form. Oral dose forms are familiar with prescribers and pharmacists and even patients. A drop under the tongue is something that is more understandable than the inhalation of a drug substance, aside from uh, asthma medications but otherwise most patients aren't familiar it's also there's the, the, the perceived risk around the diversion of cannabis floss into the drug market so all these kind of uh, aspects play a role I believe in, in uh, how and why a prescriber would prescribe a particular drug product and again for government policy and regulations these are all issues that need to be well considered and, and are being considered literally now in, in New Zealand and in Thailand. Yeah. And I suspect by yourselves. Oui. Uh, Est-ce que vous avez pu observer des effets indésirables graves du cannabis? S sorry. Uh, Adverse drug reactions. Your experience about safety. Certainly. Okay, let's think about the. the uh, 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 this again is a medicine, it's a prescription medicine, it's an unregistered med most drug products aside from Sativex, Marinol, etc. are unregistered medicines. They have varying levels of clinical data. I'm not now talking about Bedricam, but I'm talking about globally. That, that results in risks in terms of safety and the risk of adverse drug reactions and certainly some patients have consumed these products in a global setting and some symptoms may have got worse or certainly they experienced new side effects that are unwarranted. This comes back to the importance of a good prescribing protocol and the importance again of pharmacovigilance and the harmonization of data within regions. S cannabinoids at, at least when we're looking at certain levels of concentrations are relatively safe they have a wide therapeutic index however there are drug or medicine medicine interactions that uh, uh, um, we know a lot about already um, and I, these are described also in prescribing Bechcan the Dutch experience uh, would suggest that the, the duration since 2003, the availability of these standardized drug products uh, amongst the Dutch population would suggest actually there has been no major reports of adverse drug reactions with the particular dosing that is available. And I think this is a very important thing about the Dutch experience is that these products have been available for a long period of time, so there's a history of in clinical use and therefore we can actually make more um, nuanced uh, 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 insights into adverse drug reactions. And I'm going to reiterate again, even though I've said this many times, the importance of pharmacovigilance and that, that not only companies are being active in this space, but also multiple government agencies um, and research groups are collaborating to ensure that we can build the knowledge about cannabinoid medicines in a real world context. So the Dutch experience, and I've shown you information from our prescribing data and pharmacovigilance, really, we can provide that kind of information, but really there does need to be a concerted global effort uh, to, to pull, pull this data together. Does that answer your question?
question? No? Okay. I have a, a I have a question for you if I might. <laughs> is 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 the idea to to progress um, within certain indications which have been listed and I understand that 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 would um, it would be on a if if medicines were to be introduced here that um, it would be on specific indications only first. it would be first it would be on specific indications yes. yeah okay um, and the uh, the idea is around prescribing guidance will will the dutch author uh, sorry the french authorities produce robust prescribing guidance on particular medicines or would that be left to the companies to provide that information both okay this is good okay and secondly uh, what at what level uh, or, or what level of importance have both education uh, like in this form and and other forms of education um, w what is the critical level of importance here is this considered that's, that's all we have to discuss about <laughs> okay are you involved in uh, education or uh, information of a uh, general practitioner in the industry? Yes, and, and health, prof health specialists. A partnership with the university or only... Uh in partnerships with universities and clinical networks. Yes. So indeed, uh, when we reflect on this particular booklet, this was produced outside of Bechcan. Uh, this was worked uh, in line with a number of university-based clinicians uh, who are also working in their field. Yes. Certainly. Oh, well, thank you for your time. Okay. Okay. Tout le monde a tout le monde a un. Okay. C'est bon. Okay. Parfait. So thank you very much.